Meet Jeanette McCurdy. She's an author, a writer, and a big feeler. So much so that she's making a podcast all about her feelings. Jeanette's memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died, welcomed the world into the story of Jeanette and all of the intense life experiences that molded her into the person she is today. But how does she manage all of the messy, hard feelings she's feeling right now? In each episode of Hard Feelings, her new podcast with Lemonada Media, she'll tell you all about it. Jealousy, shame, social anxiety, she wants to laugh about it, cry about it, and work through it with you by her side. Why? These hard feelings are a big part of the human condition. They unite us all, but only once we're willing to face them. Hard Feelings is out now, wherever you get your podcasts. Can't get enough of your favorite Lemonada Media podcasts? By subscribing to Lemonada Premium today, you'll gain access to fun and inspiring bonus content from all of our podcasts across the Lemonada Media network. As a subscriber, you can listen to never-before-heard interview excerpts between Julia Louis-Dreyfus and her A-plus guests on Wiser Than Me, laugh along with Elise Myers as she and her guests play a rapid-fire questions game on Funny Cause It's True, and continue to uncover new ways to make life suck less through our exclusive subscriber audio. Check out a free trial of Lemonada Premium today in the Apple Podcast app by clicking on our podcast logo and then the subscribe button. Lemonada. You want to know what's music to my ears? Bread bowls. And that brings me to our beloved sponsor, Panera. Whenever I'm not sure what I'm going to do for dinner, but I know I want something nourishing that I'll really enjoy, I pick up Panera on the way home. Plus, with Panera's new crunch time feature, Panera will send you a reminder at whatever time you want to order your favorite preset dinner with one easy swipe. It's been an absolute game changer to make sure dinner is taken care of while I'm out running around. I'm going to start with my favorite, their mac and cheese, featuring a creamy rich blend of cheeses, but I also like to mix it up too, and Panera makes it easy. Sometimes I'll go with their Fuji apple salad with chicken. Or I'll try one of their unbeatably delicious and hearty soups, like their creamy tomato soup. It's a classic, and I have found no soup that pairs better with their warm, fresh bread bowl. And I have done plenty of research, trust me. So order Panera tonight to get a delicious dinner in one easy swipe. Available only in iOS mobile devices. Other restrictions apply. And for more information on clean, visit panerabread.com slash clean. I do a lot of writing for this show, and I always try to be really careful about my spelling, my grammar, and just the overall quality of my writing, but it's hard when I'm moving so quickly to check everything. That's why every single day, I'm super thankful for Grammarly. They've helped me come off so much more confident in my writing, and also, I just feel more confident sending emails, like all of the emails. Grammarly does more than just fix grammar and typos. With Grammarly Premium, it takes your writing to the next level. To me, Grammarly is like having my own personal writing consultant right there with me, letting me know when I'm maybe being a little indirect or less concise than I could be. It's those little checks with their software that make all the difference for me, helping me strike the perfect tone and actually getting things done. The free version of Grammarly offers instant proofreading with comprehensive spelling, grammar, and punctuation suggestions. They also offer a tone detector, but I recommend the premium version, which offers clarity-focused sentence rewrites. You'll be amazed at what you can do with Grammarly. Go to Grammarly.com slash podcast to download for free today. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash podcast. Okay, actually, can you just pretend that you're listening to a fully complete theme song here? I got really in my head, and I tried to make it perfect, and I couldn't. So this is going to be the theme song right here. (laughs) Hello, and welcome to another episode of Funny Because It's True. I'm Elise Myers, and our guest today is the hilarious Natalie Morales, who you may know from Parks and Recreation, Dead to Me, or her movie Language Lessons, which she wrote and directed herself. And I do have to warn you, um, what you're about to hear this week is two people basically losing their minds for 45 minutes. We have a blast discussing her new movie, No Hard Feelings, the letters she wrote to Mel Brooks, and also listen in for an incredible story about Natalie's first ever high school performance. So two things that are funny because they're true. Number one, I learned that there is a personality type where if you fail the first time you do something, it doesn't actually make you want to quit. I can't relate to this at all, but um, I did learn it exists, and it is Natalie, and I love that for her. And number two, the last 15 minutes of this episode really is just straight giggles. Like, 
A hundred percent. It's just laughing. Okay, let's get into it. Hi, Natalie. How are you? Hi, I'm good, Elise. How are you? <laughs> I'm so good. Okay, I read an article and I thought it was really interesting. I saw that um, you would write letters as a kid uh, to people you loved and even like people like Mel Brooks. And I really wanted to know, do you still do that? Are you still a letter writer? What did that come where did that come from? I will say it wasn't as a kid. It was as a full blown adult that I wrote letters. Oh, to okay. <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> I I wrote him when I first moved to LA. I never got a response back. I don't think he read them. But I wrote him very pithy letters uh, in hopes that he would mentor me because I was like, listen, if I'm going to have a mentor, might as well have the best one. Uh, of course. That there and could you, possibly you have to be. ask, right? Yeah. And I, and I did ask several times. <laughs> I don't know that it got Wait, to him. You, you sent him many letters? Many letters. Uh, to the point where I was like, stop, <laughs> stop bothering this old man. He clearly doesn't either. He's not getting this or he doesn't want to. Um, but then I got to be on, uh, on History of the World, which was like a lifelong dream come true. So that, that was cool. From the letters that you wrote? No, absolutely not. not really. Oh, <laughs> I was like, that's the that's, best story ever. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Maybe despite the letters that I wrote, I don't know. But um, I got to be on it last year, mostly because I begged everyone I knew who had anything to do with it. It was like I knew Nick Kroll who was doing it, and I knew some people at Hulu because I had just done Plan B at Hulu, and they were making History of the World. And I was like, anybody get me in it? I will just walk in the back room, please. I just need to be a part of this. What was the first thing that you said to him? Like, did did you bring it up that you wrote all these letters or were you like, I'm just going to let it lie? I've not met him. I've not oh, met okay. him in person uh, because he is very old <laughs> and he was not sure. on set. Um, <laughs> but he was at the rap party and he um, he did say hello to everybody from a distance. Like he was like, he gave a little speech and it was, I was in the same room as him, but he is so not. So he said hello to you. He does not know who I am, I doubt. I mean, I guess he's, <laughs> no, that's not true. That's not true. His producer said he thought I was very funny in the episode. He told me that. So that's good. Mel Brooks said I was funny. I did take a screenshot of that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. I'm going really far back just because I have to. I'm going to commandeer this entire interview and just ask really quick. I'm a huge Parks and Rec fan. I'm a huge Mike Schur fan. And I would love to just ask you what that was like and how that happened. And what do you feel about it? <laughs> just all of it. Okay. So... I also am a huge Parks and Rec fan. Great. I'm a huge Mike Schur fan. And it was my favorite show before I was on it, um, which I still can't believe that I was on it. That's so wild. So I got this audition to play. At the time, it was just like, a, you know, maybe one or two episode love interest for right. Aziz's character, for Tom Haverford. And I was like, oh, my God, I need to get this. <laughs> what am I going to do with this? And I, I did the thing that I do – at, at most of my auditions, um, which is I think about how everybody else is going to do it, what the natural way to do it is. And then I'm like, how do I not do that? How do I do it differently? Um, and so what I did was I did an impression of Aziz, basically. Like I read all these lines and I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> and I just like did this character kind of like that. And um and then I got the job and like, I mean, that first episode that I did was also the first episode for, um, for Rob Lowe and for, um, for Adam Scott. Wow. And it was like all three of us were on this episode, on this show for the first time. Obviously, they did way more episodes than I did, but it was really exciting to be like part of that with them. And yeah. I just remember like standing in this field at this festival watching this character that I was obsessed with, Ron Swanson, eat a turkey leg. And I was just like, this is the best day of my life. I could watch Ron Swanson do pretty much anything and it would be the best day of my life, but especially eat a turkey leg. Like, I can't believe I get to do this and be like, cool on this set. Like, it was just amazing. Did you feel like starstruck watching that happen? Completely. With all of them. It was, I mean, I I was in a makeup trailer with Amy Poehler, like, blasting the hardest, nastiest rap you could possibly imagine. <gasps> she, every, every day, what? she would have... She would have uh, parties after lunch, like a 10-minute dance party in the makeup trailer that was just like the nastiest rap you could imagine. Uh, 
And she would just. Are you lying or is this real? I'm not lying. (laughs) I'm telling you the truth. It was the best thing ever. And I just would like basically sit in the corner and watch and she'd be like, get up and dance. And I'd be like, okay. And I, it was like, it was like, it was like, for me, it was like being held at the friendliest gunpoint to dance because it was like Amy Poehler. And like, I, I, like, I didn't know what to do, but she's the nicest human being. Like, do you know how there's, I'm sure you've met people where you're like, you don't have to be nice. You're already beloved. You could just be normal, but she is so nice. Yeah. Um, and I guess I don't mean nice. I guess I mean kind. She's just very kind. Um, and so, yeah, I was starstruck every time I was on that show. It was just, it was the best. Oh my God. What was it like working with Mike Schur? Did you have a lot of interaction with him on set? Yes, so I I did, and then we did a show together called Abby's after that that he produced, right. which um, which was a dream of mine. I mean, I think I honestly think that there is no one who's working today who like, and this is a big thing to say because there's a lot of people I really respect, uh, writers and creators of shows, but no one to me does it better than Mike Sure, both in the environment he creates and in the shows he creates and in the characters he creates, like. There's a reason that The Good Place and Parks and Rec have this feeling where you feel like all of these characters are your friends. And that's not easy to do. And he does it almost effortlessly, but it's not effortless. It's with so much consideration and thought. Did he inform the way that you direct and produce like later? Totally. Really? Especially the way that I write. Um, he so Josh Malmuth created Abby's and then he um executive produced it. And so he was involved in like the bigger creation aspects of it, but um but Josh was like the person who created the show. And the two of them, I mean, it was a character named Abby, and I like I don't know if I don't know any Cubans named Abby, no, not many Latinas <laughs> named Abby. So it definitely was not written for me. And so they um, I auditioned for it because I was like, I need this. This is the new Mike Schur show. It's like I being on an NBC Thursday night show, comedy show, that's a Mike Schur show. And it was a in front of a live audience, which was like oh, wow. oh, wild and amazing. But like I was like, there's only been a few jobs that I've been like, I need this and I'm going to get it. And that was one of them. Like I, I, there was nothing in my mind that would take me away from that job. Like I like had to have it. So with that, um, they then were really um, just so collaborative in a way that I, I hadn't ever really experienced before in, in that, like, mm-hmm. this character is not really like me, but um, but they wanted to have my input on how I saw her and also, like, my Latinidad around it and, like, how yeah. how to make this character authentic. It was the first bisexual lead character of a TV show, of a, of a network TV wow. show. And that was important to me. And she's a veteran, which I am not, but it was important to me to, to play that authentically. And, um, and it was the first Cuban lead of a network show since Desi Arnaz was on uh, I Love Lucy. So like it was, those things were important um, and to get right. And they were really, um, they really listened to me and like we all discussed it. It was awesome. Did you feel pressure in that role to present yourself in a way that was authentic to you, but also represented your culture? Like, did you feel pressure? I think, you know, I don't know. I think that like, it's a mistake to think that anybody, any one person represents an entire like, like I don't represent all of queerdom or all of women or all of anything, anything that I am. And I know some people take that on and some people, some people are unfortunately like, have all of that pinned on them when they, when they don't need that and they aren't that. But like, no, I think, I think what I felt pressured to do was like, it was this opportunity that I'd been given to like yeah. lead this show. And, and it was the, you know, as, as everybody was telling me the firsts, all these firsts of things that I was like, okay, can't screw this up. And I don't think I screwed yeah. it up, um, <laughs> which I'm happy about, but I, I did, I did feel like it was so important to me to like get these little, I don't know, these little things in it that I, that I knew that people like me would be like, oh my God, I've never seen anyone talk about this on TV. Like, for example, her name being Abby was like, 
in Spanish, that would be like Abigail, which some people have that name, but it's not common. And I was like, this is an opportunity to like make a joke. There's an episode down the line where um, someone from the bar finds her mail. And so it has her real name on it, which she has kept hidden from everybody. Um, which one of my uncles, uh, his name is Abelardo, which is arguably... I'm sorry to anybody named Abelardo, a hideous <laughs> name. Like, it's such an ugly name. <laughs> and, it's, and also, so it's very like, common, isn't it? Yes, it's a very common name. But, like, yeah. even even uglier is if this man was so narcissistic that he named his daughter Abelarda. That's why she hid this her whole life. And, oh. and I just was like, that's a joke that, like, I mean, I guess everybody will get, but, like, no one has ever seen the name Abelardo on network TV, like, and no Latin person. That doesn't, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's not a thing. And yet, like you said, it's really common. And they were so down to, like, let me do that and, and pitch that idea. So it was it was great. It was stuff like that that I was like, oh, I want to do stuff that I haven't seen before, you know? Yeah. It's wild that you got to lead that because, like, so it's a really interesting balance to hold between like, I don't want to let you down. I want to be authentic to myself, but I also want to do this character that you've pl- you've put on me justice because this is your creative vision yes. and I want it all to work. And so I feel like Mike Schur would be just the perfect person for that. Yes. Yeah. You trust him. Oh, totally. And like everything I've seen behind the scenes of, of The Office and of Parks and Rec, like um, – it, people have just said it's the most collaborative experience I've ever had on a set where it's like people that had no business. Like I had like I had no business giving my opinion in this moment, but they wanted it from me because they thought it would be like play authentically on camera. It's just really cool. Yeah. OK, we have to take a quick break. But when we come back, Natalie and I talk about her newest movie that she's in, No Hard Feelings. Say goodbye to those old antacid brands and say hello to Wonder Belly Antacid. If you're like me and get heartburn from basically everything, you're going to love Wonder Belly. I know that for me, heartburn and indigestion can really affect how I'm feeling and even impact what I choose to eat, which is a huge bummer. I want hot sauce, you guys. I need hot sauce. Wonder Belly's chewable antacids instantly get rid of heartburn, acid indigestion, and a sour belly using the same active ingredients as many of the leading brands. Only Wonder Belly doesn't have talc, artificial dyes, artificial sweeteners, titanium dioxide, or GMOs. And they come in these super cute and colorful aluminum bottles. Wonder Belly antacids come in four delicious flavors, strawberry milkshake, lemon sorbet, watermelon mint, and fruity cereal. The strawberry milkshake one is my personal favorite. It's an antacid tablet that actually tastes like strawberries blended into vanilla ice cream topped with whipped cream. And it's dairy-free. And as if the flavors weren't enough, listen to Wonder Belly's tagline for this ad. Let's kick acid. Obsessed. You can get Wonder Belly antacid at Target or shop on Amazon with code 20 Elise M to get 20% off. That's 20 E L Y S E M, all one word for 20% off on Amazon. I feel like I spend so much money on food and it's hard to find good nourishing food that doesn't also cost like a million dollars. That's why this fall I'm going with every plate. They help you get more bang for your bite as America's best value meal kit. Every plate is 25% cheaper than grocery shopping with no hidden fees, so you can count on great value week after week. Plus, you only pay for what you need with pre-portioned ingredients. I just made the crispy buffalo ranch chicken with honey roasted carrots and mashed potatoes. And guys, you know how I feel about spicy food. This recipe blew my mind. I cannot believe I made it in my own kitchen. Plus, the step-by-step instructions make it really easy to make with someone else or maybe even the whole family. Every plate provides plenty of delicious variety, so you'll never get stuck in a cooking rut. With 26 tasty and affordable recipes that change every week, it's easy to find something flavorful and satisfying for every meal of the day. Plus, add even more delicious options to your order with up to 22 convenient sides, lunches, snacks, desserts, and more. It's all delicious and definitely worth checking out. Get started with Every Plate for just $1.49 per meal plus $1 steaks by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code Elise149. That's everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code Elise149.
What was the experience like um, on No Hard Feelings acting in such a huge cast, being next to Jennifer Lawrence? Yeah, it was wild. Um, it was very wild. The guy who wrote it, or co-wrote it and directed it, his name is Gene Supnitsky. He was one of the writers on The Office. Yeah. And then after The Office, he and his writing partner, Lee Eisenberg, who was also on The Office, they produced this show that I was on called Trophy Wife. And it was so fun. So I knew him from that, which was like, I think like... 2014 ish. Wow. And um, so we've known each other, I guess, almost 10 years now. And like, he wanted me to be in this part, which was kind of wild. I was like, very um, thankful that he saw me in this part. And then, yeah, it's a big, giant, like, studio movie. It was cool to get to do it and see how it gets made from that angle. It was awesome. I watched the trailer, and I loved how much physical comedy was in it. Oh, I mean, I think I can say this, but I'm, like, very pregnant in this movie. Um, I have, okay. like, a, like, a, like, a gigantic belly the whole time. Um, not actually pregnant. I, it was a fake pregnancy <laughs> belly, sure. which, which uh, I, I hate to say this to a pregnant person, but, like... <laughs> I, I was like, oh, it's so hard to get up. And like, I, I can't sit yeah. down in regular chairs. <laughs> and this is awful. No, I've heard that the pregnant, the fake pregnant belly is actually worse than being pregnant. I've heard that from a lot of people that have been pregnant really? and also played pregnancy. Yeah. Okay. I've heard that it's good. because you're wearing like a wetsuit underneath your clothes. So anytime you have to pee, don't you have to take off like all your clothes to go to the bathroom? All of it? Yes. Yes. And it's like, it's like a latex a very heavy latex belly that is like strapped on you, like overalls <laughs> underneath yeah. your clothes. And so then the top of the belly cuts into your like ribs and your lungs when you sit down. So you have to sit like all the way, all the way a, back. A pregnant and, person? Yeah. Yes, yes. It, it really <laughs> does make you move authentically, I think, most of the time. That's amazing. Except it's, it is like rock hard and you ha you do have an instinct to punch your own belly, which I don't think pregnant people have. Um, well, but uh, <laughs> just no, not, not usually. Just um, so I didn't get to do as much physical comedy as I would have liked other than, you know, walk around with this big waddle and, Being this, pregnant. and this big belly. But I do like Physical comedy has always been a really big so – I'm, I'm a huge, huge Buster Keaton fan. So for those that don't know who Buster Keaton is, um, Buster Keaton is a silent film actor who is, like, in a lot of black and white movies. And he was known for his physical comedy and his, like, super deadpan, like, stoic expression that actually earned him the nickname The Great Stone Face. And so, like – for Natalie to just be like, yeah, one of my greatest inspirations was Buster Keaton. <laughs> I was a little thrown, but it's really fascinating. This isn't an inspiration I expected you to pull out in this conversation. Was he someone that you were inspired by, like when you were a child? I wish it would have started when I was a child, because um, I think it would have given me a clearer path earlier on. But when I first moved to L.A., there, was, there used to be a place here called the Silent Movie Theater, and they played actual silent movies and I went once and I saw a Buster Keaton movie and I and like my mind was blown I have never ever connected with anyone or anything more than I did with this thing that had been made like a hundred years before and like I saw him on screen and I was like that's it that's exactly what I want to do that's exactly what I think is good that's everything and um it, it has inspired so much of my work, so much of my acting, so much of ev everything that I do, has it has inspired. Um, you, I think, you know, there's a lot of deadpan there. And I think, uh, ironically, I've been, I've become to be known for that. And that wasn't necessarily like on purpose. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't like, oh, you know what, I'm going to do like a good deadpan because I love Buster Keen. I think I just like really got into how he did things and like learned a lot from it. And then it ended up happening that way. So, um, yeah. so that's cool. How old were you when, when you kind of like found that love for si that silent film and, and just him in general? It was like, like 22 or 20. Yeah. Like around 22. And I, and I it just blew my mind. Yeah. What, you know, what's funny. I'm just realizing this now. I've asked you two questions where I assumed you have just wanted to be an actor and a comedian and a personality like mm. since childhood where I'm like, you wrote letters to, you know, Mel Gibson. <laughs> you've, you've loved, uh, what is it? Mel oh my gosh. Gibson. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Mel or, Brooks. I'm Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. Sorry. I'm so pregnant. My brain is mashed potatoes. It's, it's I can't remember good. anything it's five minutes good. ago. Anyway. <laughs> I 100% thought we were talking about Mel Gibson this entire time. 
I was like, Mel Gibson is not that old. I don't understand why you keep referring to how old he is. Did you imagine that this is kind of what you would be when you were younger? Did you have other dreams? What did that look like? No, I really, like, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. And, oh, of course. Uh, of course. <laughs> um, I loved movies and TV and, and performance. I just never thought it was something I could do. I mean, truly, representation is important because of that, because I really – I never saw anybody like mm. me on anything. And I just, it, I didn't even consider it as an option and the, as a career option, right? Like it just mm. didn't make any sense to me. People that I knew didn't do that. And um, I came from a, a fairly poor family. Um, I grew up in a one car garage with my mom that was converted wow. into a little studio and we had slept on a day bed together. And um, she was a single mom who worked a lot to like, you know, be able to give me anything, anything that I needed. And I remember there was like some, there was like a sign when I was a kid. It was like, I, I think I was like seven or eight. And there was a sign outside of the grocery store that said like kids, talent show or like play or whatever. And I was like, mom, I need to do Cause I did like do like magic shows for my family. Yeah, yeah. And, like I would force my family to watch me perform. And so I, I remember seeing some sign somewhere and being like, mom, I really have to go. And she was like, okay, okay, I'll take you. It was like on a Saturday, but she's not a stage mom. She didn't know what it required, you know? No. And like, I got there and they were like, what song do you have prepared to sing? And I didn't know that you had to prepare anything. And I was like, um, I, I don't, I don't have anything. And they're like, I, I will never forget this moment. The woman was like, in Spanish, she was like, okay, fine. Why don't you just sing I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston? And I was like, okay. <laughs> At seven? Yes. <laughs> and so I butchered the song that I barely remembered the lyrics to, right? <laughs> and then they were like, no, thank you. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to be a lawyer, again, I guess, for the performance element of it. <laughs> what, yeah, and, you're uh, just like, this is it. If I can't act, then I will help people in the legal system and I will get my performance time then. Yes, I will be like, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. <laughs> like, objection. It's like yeah, nothing's objection. been yeah. said, Natalie. <laughs> if, yeah. <laughs> Everyone just said good morning. Um, yeah, so I had to go to like my local high school um, and I didn't know anybody there because uh, I, I had gone to this really small parochial Catholic school my whole life from kindergarten to eighth grade where I only went to school with the same 30 kids. I had never worn anything that wasn't a uniform. Like this school had thousands of kids and it was just like a public high school and it was very s scary and intimidating. And um, and I was like this like dorky Hanson fan <laughs> that was like about to go into this like big school. Oh my gosh. And, and, um, and, I, and I was like uh, – Maybe I'll go to summer school before just to like meet some people. So once the like big school starts, I won't be totally alone. And I and I went yeah. and I signed up for it. And I was like, I um I know how to play guitar. So like I'll take a guitar class. And then I've always wanted to learn photography. So I'll sign up for that. And the woman was like, Oh, someone just took the last spot in photography. Why don't you try drama? I hear that's fun. And I was like, Okay, sure. And then that changed my life. Like completely changed my life. Okay, time for one more break. When we come back, Natalie tells us about her first time performing on stage in high school. Hi, folks. It's me, Chris Gethard, and I host Beautiful Anonymous. Every week, I talk to one anonymous person on the phone for an hour. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's inspirational. It gets heartbreaking. It gets dark. All of the above. I've talked to somebody who found love in a mental hospital. Talked to a woman who's about to turn herself over to federal authorities. A mother waiting on the results of her daughter's cancer diagnosis. So many more. Look out for a new episode of Beautiful Anonymous every Tuesday. Listen and subscribe to Beautiful Anonymous on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, the Sirius XM app, or your favorite podcast app. I'm Eliza Schlesinger. You know me as a stand-up comic, maybe as an actress on occasion. I'm a writer, and I've got this podcast, Ask Eliza Anything, where you, the listener, are the guest. Every week, we field questions from our audience, questions you're maybe embarrassed to ask, questions that you don't trust your friends to give you advice on, and we are here to give you the advice that people are too afraid to give you. You can find Ask Eliza Anything on SiriusXM, Stitcher, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to follow the show so you never miss an episode. Did you feel immediately when you were there like this is right or did it take some convincing for you to 100% really oh yeah I was like oh I can I can like 
control when people laugh at me. That's cool. Whoa. <laughs> I was like, great. I I can make people laugh on purpose. That's a superpower. That is both so profound and so sad all at one time. I love it so much. Yes, yes. Because I, I, I had come, like, I was like a total class clown dork. You know, that was like my only... All right, really quick. When she said that she could control when people laughed at her and like, you know, make people laugh on purpose. I definitely thought she meant like people teased her and laughed at her. So then her doing comedy and performing was a way to control when people laughed at her. But then as she started talking, I realized I misinterpreted that. So when I said it's so profound and so sad, it's not sad at all. <laughs> like not even a little bit. Social currency was being this like class clown in and I didn't have, there was no art department in the little school that I went to. There was no arts department. Like, no, there was no, like, drama or anything like that. I was, I mean, I was, like, Mary in several school plays, but, uh, you know, <laughs> nothing beyond that. And the, you know what? I don't know if I've ever told this story before, but the first time I ever went on stage, okay, so that summer we made a movie, right? And because I was, like really good friends with everybody in that class. A lot of them were juniors that were about to be seniors and I was about to be a freshman. I got like special permission to be in the senior acting class and the class was in the auditorium and we were taking this acting class and I'd never taken anything so seriously in my whole life. And I, I it was like, I, it was a dream. And our first assignment, we were learning the phonetics alphabet and we were doing, uh, we had to do commercials in these accents, like selling things. Oh, and our fr the first commercial was like a Southern accent. And I I did this thing where I was Britney Spears <laughs> at the time because she, she, oh, okay. she used to have like a real Southern accent. Like that's kind of how she talked. And I had the little, because I already had it, had the Catholic schoolgirl uniform <laughs> for this commercial. <laughs> and um, this particular day, um, one of the wings of the school, the air conditioning had broken. And so like – a hundred more people were in the auditorium and they were all seniors also. I was 14 and all these people were like an AP science, AP history, AP whatever, in the back of the auditorium, sitting quietly, uh, watching these theater kids do the, this stuff, right? And so it was extra nerve wracking because I was in this senior class and there was all these other kids in the background. And so I get up there and I go, hi, my name is Britney Spears. And my the button to my skirt <laughs> pops off. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I happen to be wearing uh, also also another first for me. My sister got me my very first thong. <laughs> no. For Christmas no. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> and it was a white mesh thong. <laughs> Elise no! is covering for anybody listening, Elise is covering her eyes right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is my nightmare. This is my nightmare. Okay. So all I said was, Hi, my name is Britney Spears, and my skirt popped off. Literally, bu the button broke, completely popped off, and I was standing there in a white mesh thong. And there was a split second of silence and then uproarious laughter. Like the most laughter I'd ever heard in my life. And I couldn't bend over because thong to pick up my skirt. Thong. You know? And so I just stood there with my hands over my crotch, kind of smiling no. and, and not knowing what to do. And until my friend came up with his jacket and like escorted me off stage. And the laughter lasted at least 15, 20 minutes. Like it, it did not stop. Because uh, I was on the side of stage. It did not. The teacher tried to control uh, everybody, but then he himself would also oh start God. laughing. Um, and, <laughs> and then it would start everybody laughing again. Um, and, and so the first time I ever went on stage, the worst thing happened, right? Like the actual <laughs> nightmare happened. And so then That's I was like, like what people picture happening so that they don't get nervous. And your brain was like, we're going to go straight from the bottom and you can, it can only get better. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened. I was like, well, <laughs> nothing can be worse than this great and so it actually helped my stage fright so much so you really like okay so hold on i <laughs> this is nothing to do with anything that we're actually <laughs> i know i don't know why so i decided badly. to tell that okay. story i feel like you would have you would <laughs> enjoy it this is the whole conversation. I don't care about anything else anymore <laughs> okay number one i love that you were like 
I have to do a Southern accent, I'm going to be Britney Spears. Not yeah. like I, in my mind, I think like to dress up with like flannel, you know, and like like a, a hat and like and you're like Britney Spears. Yeah. Also, Catholic schoolgirl Britney Spears. I had the uniform. I got to use it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, <laughs> and also, like the fact that you said you were Britney Spears <laughs> instead of. I'm so pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm imagining okay. this story okay. now, like like one of your TikToks where you use the emojis to tell the whole story. <laughs> where you're like, you need to tell great the story. story. I would love to okay, tell you. This, oh my god, Natalie, that has got to be like the best thing I have ever heard as a first performance. And you need to tell that a million more times. You need to like get on a stage and tell that, recreate it, like everything. Yeah. Oh my god. Okay, so so then how uh, my question though is like that didn't dissuade you from wanting to do performance? You were like this is it. <laughs> like this yeah, is everything. I mean, it was my very first one, so I had and the the crazy part is that it became like this running joke because the second time I ever did that stage <laughs> What is happening? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what accent it was. I can't remember what it was anymore. But I was wearing these big, like, uh, parachute pants, these big, like, cargo pants. And whoever was walking no. behind me up the stairs stepped on them and pulled them down. And then everyone was like, Shut, this is Natalie. absurd. I know. I know. It became a running joke. <laughs> So that the, your pants fell off a second yes, time. Yes, yes, my pants this time. But someone pulled them down with their <laughs> shoe. Thankfully, not too much. Like not all the way. But no white mesh thong this time. Yeah, I, not this time. Maybe, maybe I blocked it out. I don't know. But I remember it happening and everybody being like, "Oh my god, again!" Like people were like, it was, it was like a huge joke. So much so that the third time I went on stage, I was like strapped in. Like the joke was that like I, nothing could fall off me because I was like, I had like just a zipper all tape. the way to the top, like the tightest <laughs> jeans possible, just like sitting there ducked in a straight jacket on the stage. Um, you either you'd either have to do that or you'd have to go up completely naked. Yeah, There's like yeah. no in between. You can't just like yes. act like it didn't happen. This is yeah, now a part really, of your performance. Like I character. really did like take it as like okay, that is my nightmare and it happened and I yeah. lived it and I survived it. What else can go? And I, you know, I've applied it to other areas in my life where I'm like, think of the worst thing that could happen, deal with that. And then you're fine. That is so impressive. I think that genuinely that would um, scar me for <laughs> the rest of my <laughs> life. And I think I'd be like, it's a sign. It, it's a sign I wasn't meant for me and I receive it and I'm just going to go be a lawyer. I don't think, I don't think it's for me. And you're like, I loved it so much. I want to do it a second <laughs> time. And then I'm like, <laughs> and I just do it again. <laughs> and like, I feel like you getting that out of the way so early genuinely was like this huge, like, well, what's the worst that can happen? We're just going to go for it. And now look at you now. It's crazy. Thanks. I think it did. I think a part of me honestly was like, I don't want to be known for that. And so like, I didn't get yeah. to do what I had practiced and what I really wanted to do, which was clearly this amazing monologue as Britney Spears. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, I... <laughs> I, I didn't get to do that. So I didn't want it to be all that it was. And that's right. what pushed me more. It wasn't that I, I was like, oh, I this was a great experience. Let me do this again. It was like, I don't that that wasn't what I wanted to do. And I'm going to keep going until I can do what I wanted to do, because yeah. I don't want my pants falling off to be all <laughs> I'm known for. I don't want to be the white mesh thong girl. All right. <laughs> yes. It can be adjacent to what I'm known for, but I, I want at least the opportunity to have the duality of something instead of that be the only thing, you know? Do you carry this attitude with you into like everything you do? Like, do you care about critics or reviews? Completely. I think um, I was just doing this interview right before this where she was like, what's your relationship to critics and like reviews? And like, how do you, how do you feel about that? And I was like, well, I think that... Um, because I'm like a Latina and a woman and I'm queer and like all of those other things, we don't get that many opportunities. So when we are given an opportunity, they don't give us another one unless that one is successful. Wow. And so it does feel like everything is riding on it. And I don't 
come from a really rich family and, and, and I'm not a Nepo baby, so I'm not guaranteed another opportunity. And so that aspect of it, I do want my things to do well because I want to work again. <laughs> Beyond that, I know that a lot of my favorite things that I've loved and that have spoken to me and, and the people that I relate to have been things that haven't been critically acclaimed or well-received or well-reviewed. Yeah. I also am, I think I can be really... Um, impartial about my own work. I know when something is good or bad, yeah. even if I've done it. I'm not super biased in that way. I might be biased in the other direction where I have like really high standards for something and people are like, this is really good. And I'm like, it's not as good as it could yeah. be. But I do know when I've done something that I really like, and especially if my best friend Serena really likes it, and if like my core group of people really yeah. like it, I'm like, they don't lie to me. This is good. And I don't really care what anybody else says. I saw this quote you said in an interview with Mark Duplass where you say, um, in your job, there's a lot of room for I don't know and can you help me, but there's no room for doubt. Do you remember saying that? I, I like Because personally, it's like one of the most powerful things I've ever heard. Um, you should like put it on a plaque and hang it in your room. But because of the way that I was brought into this job, there's just I, – I, there's so many moments where I just second guess everything that I do. And so – I just think it's really powerful to kind of hear you talk about what you do um, because you made this happen by yourself. And it's just, it's a really beautiful thing to kind of hear your story a little bit. Like, and now, I don't know, it's just, you, you're a very, very special person. And I just, I'm like, not going to cry. I'm so pregnant and emotional that I'm like, you're so amazing. I'm going to literally <laughs> cry. But um, yeah, your so story you. is just very, very powerful. I, I just, I, it's, I want you to share it all the time to everybody because it's really cool to hear kind of how you've made this happen for yourself. Thank you, Elise. Yeah. <laughs> so so is yours. And honestly, look, as as an outsider and of someone who is a fan of yours, and this is unsolicited advice, I'm sorry, but I'm giving you this. Um, the uh these people that have given you these opportunities and and are like you said, you don't want to disappoint because they've they've like given you these chances to do things. It's because they see you and go, I like her instincts and I like, and this is a sure bet for me. Like, and that means that your instincts are good. Thank and you. so just trust them. Also, the other very important thing to remember is that no one knows what the fuck they're doing. No one. People have experience in things and, and those people are, uh, might have a little better idea of how to do something. But that doesn't mean that their experience is the right way to do something. And it doesn't mean that it's always the right way to do something. Like, that is why people with experience sometimes get eclipsed by new people, mm. because someone finds a better way to do it. Nothing ever changes. Nothing ever progresses. The world doesn't move forward if people don't do things in a different way. And so do you. Like, you're doing great. You're doing so great. You're doing this right, well, I'm pregnant <laughs> and doing a million things. Like, you, like, don't – whenever that anxiety creeps up, like, just listen to – you're here for a reason, clearly. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Wow, thank you. All right, everybody be cool. It's a normal day. Um, <laughs> I know that we're at time, so I will let you go. But seriously, Natalie, it was so good to meet you. You too. I could talk to you forever. This is so fun. I know. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Natalie Morales. Definitely check her out in the movie No Hard Feelings, which is in theaters June 23rd. And if you like this show, give us a rating and a review. It helps other people find us. All right, we'll be back next week with more Funny Cause It's True. Bye. There's more Funny Cause It's True with Lemonada Premium. Get access to all of Lemonada's premium content, including My Five Questions with Sam B., which aired last Friday. Subscribe now and Apple Podcasts. Funny Cause It's True is a Lemonada Media and Powder Keg production. The show is produced by Claire Jones and Zoe Dennis. Our senior producer is Jamila Zara williams and our associate producer is Oha Lopez. Rachel Neal is our senior director of new content, and our VP of weekly production is Steve Nelson. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles-Wax, Jessica Cordova-Kramer, Paul Feig, Laura Fisher, Kessla Childers, and me, Elise Myers. This show is mixed by Johnny Vince Evans, additional help from Noah Smith and Ivan Kryev. Our theme song music was written by me and scored by Xander Singh. Follow Funny Cause It's True wherever you get your podcasts or listen ad-free on Amazon Music with your Prime membership. Hey listeners, I'm here today to tell you about Lemonada Media's newest limited podcast series called Declined. 
This 10-part series takes you through the journey of two exceptional women from incarceration to freedom, ultimately leading to the creation of the Returning Artists Guild, an organization that uplifts the artwork of currently and formerly incarcerated artists across the country. Call Declined premieres November 27th wherever you get your podcasts. What's up, everyone? I'm Delaney Fisher, comedian and serial entrepreneur. And I'm Kelsey Cook, comedian and, I swear this is real, a world champion foosball player. (laughs) On our podcast, Self Helpless, we dig into everything from heartbreak to career burnout to the wild stories from our 20s and the many anxieties we've experienced along the way. We're often joined by guests who range from celebrities to renowned health experts. And together, we'll unpack big topics like deciding whether or not we want kids, building your dream career, strength self-trust, and much, much more. So join us every Monday for an unfiltered, entertaining, and honest conversation with friends where you don't even have to leave your house. If you're not wearing pants, we will never know. That's right. So listen to (laughs) Self Helpless wherever you get your podcasts. Yes. 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 Yes.